Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. We're continuing our Christmas series entitled, Jesus is the Reason for the Season. And this is our third message in this series. It's entitled, Jesus, the Spirit of Hope. Jesus, with his birth, brought hope to a hopeless world. All of humanity lay hopelessly bound to a fallen world, full of darkness until the light of the world entered our world, and the light shone in the darkness, giving light to all who will come. Because when the light showed up, darkness fled away and hope emerged. And with that said, please turn with me to our scripture reading found in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 34. It's about the birth announcement of Jesus, the spirit of hope. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? This portion of scripture starts out in the sixth month, which begs the question, the sixth month of what? The answer is, in the sixth month of the pregnancy of Mary's cousin, Elizabeth. See, Elizabeth was barren, and she and her husband, Zachariah, were well advanced in years, meaning that they were now old. But during his, his lifetime, or during his time serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, the angel Gabriel appeared to him when he went to burn incense before the Lord. The angel Gabriel told Zechariah that his prayer was heard and that his wife Elizabeth will bear him a son. Not ifs, ands, or buts. She will bear a son. That meant that if Zachariah's prayer was heard and would result in his wife bearing him a son, then he would doubtlessly have been praying for a child, namely a son to carry on his name. But at, at any rate, Zachariah was troubled when he saw the angel. But the angel told him, fear not, fear not, Zachariah, because his message, the angel's message to Zacharias was a good one. It was good news. He was going to have a son that will bring him joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at the birth of his son. Then the angel told him to name his son John. This is the same John who came baptizing in the Jordan River. He was the forerunner. He was the chosen forerunner for Jesus. He is the one prophesied in, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 through 5. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The New King James Version. 
John the Baptist fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy. Now, this same angel, Gabriel, was also sent to a virgin by the name of Mary in a city of Galilee named Nazareth to let her know that she was the chosen one. She would be the mother of Jesus, the spirit of hope for the whole world. Now Mary was betrothed to a man from the line of David by the name of Joseph. Although Mary was pledged to be married, she had not had sexual relationships with her betrothed. She was still a virgin, thus fulfilling another of Isaiah's prophecies. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In fulfillment of this prophecy, Mary became the first recipient of the very first Christmas present. She did not ask, but rather she was told that she was chosen. She would be the chosen one. Essentially, she would be the mother of God. What a great honor and a privilege for Mary. Now, that is not to say that she had no choice in the matter, because she did. But instead of counting the cost, instead of demanding, what's in it for me? Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary accepted the plan of the Lord, come what may. Her only concern was to please her God, and in so doing, she became the recipient, as I said, of the very first Christmas present. Make no mistake, Mary needed a savior herself, just like everybody else in the whole wide world. Mary needed a savior, even though she was the mother of the savior whose name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. She still needed saving. She could not save herself. So it is with each and every one of us. We all need a savior. I'm sure this is not the Christmas present that Mary had envisioned for herself, nor had she thought about, nor even considered. Nonetheless, she gracefully accepted her part in God's eternal plan. I read a story about a little girl who was asked by her father what she would like for Christmas. It goes like this. A young girl was asked, what would you like for a Christmas present? To any young girl, such a question would evoke delighted visions of long wished for possessions. But to Dolly, to answer her father, John Byron was, please write me a poem. So on Christmas morning, 1749, Dolly found on her plate at breakfast a piece of paper on which was written a hymn entitled, Christmas Day for Dolly. Soon after, John Wainwright, the organist of Manchester Parish Church, wrote a tune for it. On the following Christmas morning, Byron and Dolly were awakened by the sound of singing below their windows. It was Wainwright with his choir singing Dolly's hymn, Christians Awake. It goes like this, Christians awake, salute the happy morn whereon the Savior of the world was born. Rise to adore the mystery of love, when hosts of angels chanted from above. With them the joyful tidings first begun of God incarnate and the Virgin's Son. These words are so appropriate for our time. It seems like the church, the body of Christ, it's fast asleep. It is high time for the church to awaken herself and to rise to the great calling of our Lord and Savior. To spread the good news for which Jesus came to the earth that very first Christmas morning. To bring us that great news. Jesus is the good news. Let me give you some advice. 
Don't get caught up in the date. Don't get caught up in the date. Don't get caught up in the day uh, on the 25th of December, but celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. This is the day that we have set aside, December the 25th, to remember the birth of our Lord and Savior. He came to bring us hope, hope we would never ever have without his birth. So Christians awake, salute the happy morn, where on the Savior of the world was born. Rise to adore the mystery of love, which hosts of angels chanted from above. With them the joyful tide and first begun of God incarnate and the virgin son. Jesus is God incarnate. He came being fully God, born of a virgin, making him fully man in order to save man from his or her sins. Whomsoever will, let him come, let her come. Let everyone who hunger come. Let everyone who thirst come. Jesus is willing to give life. And not just life, but life more abundantly. Now I want you to consider what the angel said to Joseph when he found out that Mary was pregnant and the child was not his. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. And this is the angel speaking. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. See, the name Jesus is Greek for the Hebrew name Joshua, which means salvation. The website Christ.org has this on their website. Jesus means God saves, rescues, and delivers. And that is really, really good and appropriate definition. Because Jesus, being God, does save. Jesus does rescue. And Jesus does deliver. In other words, Jesus brings hope, which makes him the spirit of hope. To save means that he gives us salvation, which means we now inherit eternal life. We get to live forever with Jesus. If only, if only we accept him as Lord and Savior. That is the only way we can live forever with him. If we accept what he did on Calvary for us. Which was to shed his blood that we might have life. And this life that we are now living is not about us. It's not about the here and now. It's not what can we get out of it? It's all about preparing for eternity, preparing to be with Jesus forever and ever, and trying to save souls, if it's possible, as many as possible, so that they too can share the hope that we have, the hope of eternal life. We're all destined to spend eternity one place or, or another, either we will spend it in eternity in blissfulness with Jesus. Or we will spend eternity in a fiery lake with extreme torment every single day of eternity. There will be no peace for those who go there. And it's all your choice. All you have to do is to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you don't have to go there because Jesus paid the price for you. He gave you, he has a ticket with your name on it to heaven, to eternity with him. That is your escape, your get out of jail free card. All you gotta do is to come to Jesus and ask him and he'll give it to you. Because Jesus came to suffer he came to die so that we would not have to. He loved us that much. He gave us the choice of blessings or cursing. We don't have to go and spend eternity in eternal torment. 
All we have to do is to humble ourselves and ask for his forgiveness. That's all we have to do. And I don't believe that it's too much for Jesus to ask us to humble ourselves and to come to him to receive life. The Reverend F.C. Barnes has a song about Jesus and his work of salvation. In the song, he describes Jesus and what he did for us, how he was crucified on the cross. And then he asks a question, what more do you want him to do? Jesus did everything that's necessary for life and he gives it to us. But we just got to come. We got to come to him in order to receive. He will not force it upon you. It has to be your own free will. Jesus has done everything necessary. There's nothing left out. Happiness, enjoyable eternity with him. It's all right there for you to receive. All you have to do is to say, Lord, I accept your free gift of salvation. So the question is, what more do you want him to do? See, the word rescue means to deliver. It means to set free, to help out of distress. We were all in distress. We all needed freedom. We all needed to be freed and delivered. And Jesus came, born of a virgin, laid in a manger so that we can be delivered, freed, and helped out of our great distress of owing a debt we could not pay back. So, in all of this, Jesus has made us more than conquerors. We all who have accepted the free gifts are all overcomers. We have overcome and we will overcome because Jesus overcome the world. We can overcome the world. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But getting back to our message, the scripture where it talked about, Mary asked the angel this question, how will this be since I am a virgin? Mary was not challenging the news. She was not in doubt about the news. Not like Zachariah. See, Zachariah asked pretty much the same type of question. He asked, how shall I know this? In other words, how can I be sure that what you're saying or what you're telling me is the truth? Zachariah was asking in unbelief, but Mary was asking in ignorance, meaning she did not understand. She did not know how this could come about, but she knew all things are possible for God, and she believed. Look at what the angel told her as to how this whole miraculous thing would come. Luke chapter 1, verse 35 through 38. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The angel explained to Mary that this is not a normal pregnancy. It's not a regular type of pregnancy. It is a miraculous pregnancy involving the Holy Spirit. A miraculous pregnancy, for a miraculous birth, for a miraculous child, the Lord Jesus. Even Muslims believe that Jesus had a miraculous birth. But what I want you to understand is that Jesus did not have his beginnings at his miraculous birth. Nor was he created from dust as Adam was. He existed before the world began. Since he is God and he came to bring hope to a hopeless world. Please understand that 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So in order to bring hope to a hopeless world, there had to be a perfect blood sacrifice. Therefore, Jesus, being God and perfect in all his ways, had to come as a human in order to save humans. Otherwise, we would be helplessly lost. There would be no hope for us. Thus, without the miraculous birth, which we celebrate at Christmas, there would be no death. And without the death, there would be no miraculous resurrection. And without the resurrection, there is no hope. Look at what, what I mean. Paul says it best. Turn with me to his writings. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 through 19. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. And if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Here is the bottom line. This is the fundamental belief of all Christians. You cannot call yourself a Christian without this basic belief that Jesus, being God, came as a baby born of a virgin. Jesus lived and went around doing good. Jesus died on a cross and was buried, and on the third day was raised to life again. Jesus ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus is coming back one day to reward the faithful with life and to bring judgment on the faithless. That is the whole gospel message in a nutshell. As Christians, this is what we believe. This is what we live by. Only the faithful will be chosen. All others will perish. Anton Pavlik Chekhov, a Russian short story writer, play writer, and musician, once wrote to a friend, medicine is my lawful wife, literature is my mistress. When I get fed up with one, I spend the night with the other. Though it is irregular, it is less boring this way. And besides, neither of them loses anything through my infidelity. Well, that might be fine and dandy for Chekhov, but it does not work that way with Jesus. See, Jesus himself tells us this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will devote to one and despise the other. See, Jesus demands fidelity from us. He demands our all. See, Jesus gave up all. He gave up everything for a short time, 33 and a half years, so that he could bring us hope, so that he could dwell on earth as a man, so that he could die and be raised again. He gave up the splendor of heaven to come to this old dusty earth. He knew what it was like to be hungry, to be thirsty, to be weary, to be tired. He knew what it's like to be rejected. He went through it all. He was tempted, yet without sin. Jesus gave up everything 
for those years that he was upon the earth so that he could bring us hope so that we in turn could have everything and so he suffered and died once for all that we through his death might have life and have life more abundantly jesus was born to die he came into this world and on what we consider to be Christmas Day, that's what we celebrate on Christmas Day, the birth of Jesus. It doesn't matter whether that was the day he was born on or not. It doesn't matter if that's the correct date or not. That is the day that we set aside to remember and to celebrate his birth because without his birth, there's no death. Without his death, there's no life. You see, if you miss Jesus, you miss salvation. If you miss salvation, you miss eternity. And if you miss eternity, you've missed everything. Nothing is complete, nor is it fulfilled without Jesus. Some might not realize it, but we were created to worship God. And humans will worship something. Humans will worship someone. Whether it is the one true God, whether it's a false God, whether it's an idol, whether it's another human, or whether it's themselves. In other words, whether it's self-worship. I repeat, humans will worship something or someone. So to say that you do not worship anything or you do not worship anyone is misleading and a denial of the truth. So the question then is, who are you worshiping? Is it Jesus, the spirit of hope? Or is it someone or something else? Here's the thing. Jesus is our only hope. Jesus is the only name given unto man by which he must be saved. He was born and laid in a manger. He lived and died and was raised to life again. Now he's coming back real, real soon to get us, to get all those who have put their hope and their trust in him. So I ask you again, are you ready for that return? If not, you can be. Let this Christmas be your new birth and live forever. And if you want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and live forever, all you have to do is to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I accept your free gift. I accept it now. I believe that you're coming back and I want to be ready. Help me to be ready so that where you are, there I can be also. I accept it now in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get a Bible. Read your Bible. Whether it's it's off the bookshelf or whether you got to go and buy one, get a real Bible, a physical Bible and read it every day. Yes, you can read it on your phone or on your iPad or on your computer. That's fine too, but also get a real Bible, a physical Bible and read it. And get a highlighter, highlight your, your Bible. Highlight those verses that are meaningful. Learn them, refer back to them. Hide them away in your heart that you might not sin against Jesus. When he comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. The other thing I want you to do is to find a Bible-believing church who believes in the power of Almighty God, who believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, who believes in right way and a wrong way of living, who believes that thus saith the Lord and rejects the way of the world. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, 
He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to say Merry, Merry Christmas to everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.